We now turn to questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. Uh, Mr Michael Copeland is not in his place. Uh, I should advise members that questions 6 and 8 have been withdrawn. So I now turn to uh, Ms Michelle Michael Bean. Question 2. Thank you, Member, uh, for her question. Um, the, I'm very keen to see the European Investment Bank fund projects in Northern Ireland, and I intend to engage with senior officials from the bank in the coming months on this issue. I also met with the European Investment Bank and the University of Ulster last year in relation to the Jordanstown campus relocation to Belfast City Centre. As the, the member may be aware, the university has been in intensive negotiations with the European Investment Bank over recent months. And I understand that these discussions are progressing positively. I call Michelle McElveen. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and obviously thank the Minister for his response. Further to that, could I ask for his assessment of the role that the European Investment Bank can play in local investment? Yeah, I, I think there are uh, huge uh, opportunities for Northern Ireland to avail of of funding from the European Investment Bank. The, as I say, the University of Ulster are in you know, ongoing, uh, ongoing negotiations. I hope that in, in the coming weeks we will hear that they have been successful in those, those negotiations. Um, but I think that we shouldn't rest on our laurels and just take that as, as the, the full extent of what we can do with the EIB. EIB offers um, projects of the size and scale of the likes of the relocation from Jordanstown to the centre of Belfast by the university, um, the opportunity to have funding over a longer period of time and at sometimes a significantly lower rate than projects would be able to get elsewhere on the market. Uh, so I'm very, very keen to explore other possibilities with um, the EIB. In fact, I intend to meet again with officials in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, some of the projects that I'm, I'm keen to um, about having any specific projects in mind. I think one of the areas where there is huge opportunity potentially moving forward is for our reformed local government to avail of, of, of some of those uh, potential borrowings from the EIB. If we've got bigger councils, with, particularly with more power, such as the power of regeneration uh, of towns and city centres, then I think there are opportunities for reformed councils and bigger councils to work with the EIB either on individual projects or perhaps in bundling some projects together to avail of that cheaper finance and, importantly, to get some projects and infrastructure on the ground that will improve the lives of people in Northern Ireland. We call Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I agree entirely with the Minister. There is huge potential here. How does the Minister propose to engender the same obvious enthusiasm that he has for uh, the European Investment Bank with his colleagues in the executive uh, and, and other uh, government bodies? Yeah, I, I, think that, well, I, I think there is a, a willingness, as you, you can see by the uh, January monitoring statement that I, that I made to the House this morning, Mr Deputy Speaker, where the allocation of some £35 million pounds over, in, a, in a loan over two years uh, to the University of Ulster uh, for, for the moving into his, his constituency, whilst that is... Um, you know, whilst the work with the EIB wasn't contingent on getting that, I think it sends, sends a clear marker on behalf of the executive to the EIB that the executive is serious about working with them to fund potential projects moving forward. Now, we would have issues with using EIB funding to um, build some of central government capital projects, so roads and schools and so forth. That has to have, um, our, our, because if we, if we avail of that funding, it actually comes off our, our block grant, and we would have to pay, even though it's a lower rate of interest, we would still have to pay that interest. So we would be net worse off uh, in the longer term. Um, that's why I do think there are potential for the likes of the university, for colle um, colleges who are uh, universities like University of Ulster and Queen's here at arm's length from government for local government because it doesn't score on their balance sheet in the same way. And that's why I'm keen to, to meet with the EIB to scope out those potentials that there are for, for Northern Ireland, which I think there are many. I call Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. And I wonder if he'd clarify for me when we're looking at what the EIB has been used for when it comes to education. Um, you just indicated that it can't be used for building schools. Are there other areas within education that we can use the funding um, to help schools? It's, there, there are, you know, it, it could be used for schools, but it, um, the point is that it's of no benefit in using it. You know, we could go and access this money, but because of um, Treasury rules, it's going to score against our, us. It's going to come off our balance sheet and we're going to have to pay interest. And that's not a situation that, that I would think was advisable. Um, 
you know, this, is, this sort of work is very, very early stages. Obviously, the EIB has been around for a while. It is showing some interest in Northern Ireland, Deputy Speaker, as a place to, that it wants to invest in. And at a time whenever finances are short, and indeed you know, capital has been short, we're in a slightly better position in terms of our capital budget now than we were a couple of years ago. But things are still, still tight, and while the private sector still languishes where it does, in terms of, of infrastructure and construction work, I think it's important that we scope out all of the opportunities that are there. I think there's almost a challenge to be put out by us in central government to local government, to universities, to, to others within the education sector, health sector, whatever it might be. As long as they're outside of, of government, we're happy to work with them and facilitate them to bring forward any projects and work with them and the AIB to make those a reality. You know, I do see in some ways uh, the Department of Finance's role, indeed the executive's role as a whole, as a, as a facilitator and as an enabler, and to try to make projects in the, in the way that we sort of have, in a way, with the University of Ulster, try to make those a reality um, so that we can reap the positive benefits from it. I call Cahill Boylan. Could I thank you and thank the Minister for his answers, but could the Minister expand a wee bit in relation to how the new council structures actually can access the, the resources, and also is he going to issue guidance or some support? In relation to how they can do that, or Yeah, well, look, you know, principally, uh, local government reform is principally the responsibility of the, the Minister of the Environment. But I, I appreciate that on this sort of area, it's not uh, an area of work that the Department of Environment would be particularly focused on historically. It, it is um, at this minute in time. I, I can understand why the Department of Environment would be keen just to make sure that the RPA happens in the time frame that has been set out for it. Um, but I, I think if we, if we wait as an executive until after reform happens and the, the new 11 councils are in place, then it will be an opportunity will have been lost to at least have a conversation to engage councils in the potential of the EIB and indeed other um, ventures that they could go into to bring in outside money to develop our, our local infrastructure. I think they, they can do it because my understanding is they, they, they can now borrow their, their, their borrowing powers are less restricted as a result of a local government finance act that passed a number of years ago. I think the member was probably still on the committee at that time. Uh, obviously, they have bigger rate bases and they have more powers to spend that bigger rates income on. So I think there are huge opportunities in the way that you can see in, in Scotland, for example, where they have ramped up their infrastructure spend over the last number of years. It hasn't been done by councils by and large, or by central government by and large. It has been done more so by councils. So I want to see that because of the, the, the Treasury treatments of that expenditure, us work with local government to enable them to get them into a stronger position where they could work with the EIB or they could work with the private sector or they could work with others to get that investment, to invest in infrastructure in their localities that will not only improve their own particular areas but will have a beneficial impact for the whole of Northern Ireland as well. I call David McNary. Question two, Deputy Speaker. Question three. I met with the uh, Chief Secretary to the Treasury on the 18th of November, where he reinforced his intention to impose penalties should the Northern Ireland Executive and this Assembly not progress the Welfare Reform Bill by January of 2014. The UK Government has not yet specified how this Dell budget reduction will be applied. However, as the Member will know from the January Monitoring Round statement earlier, I have had to make a provision of £15 million for penalties we will incur this year. The Northern Ireland Welfare Reform Bill remains stalled at consideration stage. And we now need to progress this bill as a matter of urgency to, to avoid any further fines. I call David McNary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm indebted to the uh, Minister for his answer. Uh, and I did hear uh, what I thought was a meaningful warning um, about the rolling on of uh, debts or call ups by the Treasury, which we could end up in 200 million uh, if we don't do something about this. And I think it's about time we did do something about it. However, since April 2007, prices have risen uh, by 18 per cent on the average. Question, please? Pardon? Could we have a question, please? Can I repeat, uh, Deputy Speaker, where I was in the middle of a, of, a, of, a, of a question? Could I have a question, please, shortly, or we will move on? I'll tell you what, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, I, I'll sit down. I don't like the way you're doing this. Okay. Chester Ibra Chahar, Alaskan Corley. Question four. Oh, uh, right, okay. I'm, I'm 
I'm not sure what quite happened there, but uh, with your permission, I'm not sure whether I will get it or not, but with your permission, Deputy Speaker, I would like to answer questions 4 and 12 together. Uh, I'm currently in the process of, of meeting with the local banks as part of the ongoing series of ongoing discussions I have along with the Enterprise Minister. Earlier this month, I met separately with Bank of Ireland, Barclays, Danske Bank, First Trust, HSBC and Santander. I am due to meet Ulster Bank next month. I discussed a uh, broad range of issues with each of them, including trends in lending, their overall performance, restructuring and the use of national lending initiatives. The, sorry, the, the Enterprise Minister and I have also met bank representatives on the Agri-Food Loan Fund initiative. Uh, I have spoken on a number of occasions to Ulster Bank management about the interruptions to their service because of IT failures. And I have also regularly engaged with the senior management of the banks at other times and events on specific issues over the past six months, as indeed have my officials. I call Mickey Brady. I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister is aware that SMEs are the key to economic growth in our local economy. Does the Minister agree that there remain suspect dealings between the banks and SMEs, and has he any confidence that the banks will not engage in any such uh, future activities in 2014? Mr. Speaker, thank, thank the member for, for, his, for his question. Um, I, I, I agree that you know, we, we are sometimes very focused on attracting big name companies into Northern Ireland to create jobs. That's, that's very much part of our economic strategy. But I agree with him entirely that it is going to be the, the recovery in small and medium sized enterprises, which are account for such a large section of our economy, where we will really start to see the, the recovery creep back and we will start to see uh, employment increase as well as, as, as economic growth happen. Um, you know, like, I, I think, depending on who you talk to and when you talk to them and what circumstances are in, you get entirely different stories about whether, there is, um, whether the banks are doing a good job or the banks are doing a bad job. I think it does very much depend on the particular circumstances of the customer who goes in and, and asks and, and, and when they go for that. We, we, we get, as the member will be aware, we get um, some very headline figures from the British Bankers Association about, about lending. Um, and whilst that had shown over from 2010 when we started getting the figures a downward trend in lending, it was, it was interesting and, and I think positive that in the first two quarters of 2013 there was an increase in, in new lending uh, and that also was reflected in an increase in the average loan value of the past three years. And in the engagements that we're having with banks, they are repeating what they actually repeated at the uh, uh, Westminster Select Committee evidence uh, by two of them a couple of weeks ago where they said that the, the issue is now for them much less about uh, supply of, of uh, funding, it's actually about a demand coming in through the door. Now, we could rehearse why that might be the responsibility on the part of the banks as to why people aren't coming in and whether there's a fear about coming in. I am aware of some of the, the, the concerns that have been expressed by individual businesses about the treatment that they have had with banks. And what I can say is if anybody has any evidence of bad treatment and, and they think that my offices can, can help to assist them in any way with the banks, I'm more than happy to help. I call Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer there. But can the Minister tell me what discussions he has had locally with the Ulster Bank, the RBS, and the appropriate Treasury Minister to ascertain what can be done to prevent more companies being forced out of business by the seizing of assets and the calling in of loans? Yeah, thank the Member for a question. It's a very, very good question uh, and very, very timely, very, very pertinent question, and it is something which has perhaps come. There was always a, Mr. Brady sort of alluded to this as well in his question. This has been an issue that has kind of been rumbling on really since the, the start of the crisis, and uh, evidence, albeit anecdotal, coming forward uh, from various companies of, of what they might describe sharp practice from some of the banks who were, you know, seizing their assets, uh, putting them out of business in order to repair their own balance sheet. Now. You know, I, think I would add that that is uh, anecdotal. We get some of that evidence comes through the department. It is hard for us to assess whether it is, it is true or accurate or not because we don't have a full view of everything. Uh, Lawrence Tomlinson, um, as a member of WeWork, carried out a, a review on behalf of the, the business secretary, Vince Cable. Um, so it happens that I'm, I'm meeting with uh, him tomorrow, actually. And um, since his report was published, and before setting up this meeting, we have had some people who have raised some particular concerns about the practice the banks uh, have with them. I have passed that all on to the appropriate pair. And there are, of course, there are various inquiries going on following on from Lawrence Tomlinson's report. And I'm going to engage him tomorrow in how we can feed any Northern Ireland evidence into that. And as I said to Mr. Brady, if individual members or those outside have, have evidence of so-called sharp practice, I'm more than happy to pass that channel that on anonymously through the, the appropriate authorities. Called Patsy 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answers. Uh, could I ask the Minister uh, if he could give us an update, uh, give the House an update on the key themes of the, any submission or engagement that he has had with the Northern Ireland Select Affairs Inquiry into banking here in the North, please? Deputy Speaker, thank the member for, for his question. I, I gave evidence uh, to the inquiry just, just before Christmas. I'm sure if the member wants to sit and you know, listen to me talking for an hour and a half. I'm sure it's available on the internet. Um, just a potted history. He wants. Uh, you know, I, I was. I, I very much welcomed the inquiry that they that they have initiated. Um, I think it's it's timely as well. The fact that it's probably overdue in many respects, and I think this is probably something that we would all agree that there hasn't been sufficient attention at a national government level uh, on the, the particular banking problems that we have in Northern Ireland. I think there has been a sort of a belief that. The problems that have affected banking and lending to, to small businesses in particular in Great Britain are exactly the same as the problems that we have here. And the member will be, be aware that our problems have been um, uh, very much different from mainland Britain. Not entirely different, but very different in terms of it's been more, much more of an issue of risk caused by the property overhang. The, so in that sense, it's actually, uh, I think I said this, it's more of an Irish problem that we have rather than a British problem. Um, so I welcome the engagement that they had. There was a good discussion back and forward about some of the solutions, that, uh, some concentration, as you might expect, on, on RBS and some possible solutions to, to that situation and indeed banking in general. So I, I welcome the fact that they are focusing at Westminster on this issue. I look forward to the report going. In fact, I think there's still more evidence, particularly from our local banks, to, to feed into that. And I hope that it, it will be, as long with, along with other work like the Joint Ministerial Task Force, which Arnie Foster and I are engaged on with Treasury Ministers and Business Department Ministers and our, and our Secretary of State, I think it, it just adds up into a, a renewed focus on banking and the need to get lending out into the community, because I'm sure the member would agree, as we see signs of recovery creeping into the economy, we need our banks to start functioning properly again, getting much needed lending out to businesses who are really about to grow again and start to employ people so we can get things moving. I call Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the Minister's uh, statement and commitment. Um, the small and medium sized businesses is the uh, backbone of our co local economy, um, and we know the difficulties that they've had over recent times. And despite all the, the good and, and intentions can we have a of the question, Minister. Please? Yeah, the, um, the problem still exists. Has the, the Minister explored any possibility with the local credit unions in Northern Ireland to see if a business credit union could be established to assist and to get over the hump that we are at the moment experiencing with banks? Speaker, thank the member for his question. It, it was a, actually the, the whole uh, issue of, of credit unions did come up in the, the evidence that I gave to the Northern Ireland Select Committee um, on, on the back of a question from, from one of the members of the committee. Uh, and I, I think credit unions have played a, a traditionally a, a very good role in Northern Ireland. Uh, we have, they have a much better penetration into the market here in Northern Ireland than they do in Great Britain. And I, I can recall that a couple of years ago legislation was changed so that regulation of the credit unions rested not with uh, the relevant department here, which is DETI, but actually rested with the, the Financial Services Authority, which is now the Finan uh, Financial Conduct Authority. Um, so I think there is potential for them to uh, expand their scope, particularly on, on personal lending. Whether business lending is something that they want to get into, much beyond what they sort of do at the minute on a small level, I'm not sure. I haven't had any formal engagement, but I would certainly welcome engagement from them, uh, as I would from anybody who wants to, to get into the Northern Ireland market to help, whether it be you know, on the personal banking side, people want to get mortgages, or whether it's business lending. Anybody who wants to get into our market, I'm very willing to meet with them, discuss the, the issues that we have, and encourage them to come into Northern Ireland, because I think one of the problems that we have had over the last couple of years is that there hasn't been competition in many ways in, in our banking sector. And we're starting to maybe see a little bit more of that now, um, but we do need to see new entrants at all different levels, so I very much welcome any engagement with the credit union movement. I call Bronwyn McGahan. question five. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Member, for Quest and Average earnings in Northern Ireland are linked to the general performance and overall structure of the local economy, including factors such as labour productivity and the relative supply and demand of suitably qualified staff. While we have made some good progress in recent years, historically growth in output and employment has tended to be relative in relatively lower value added areas, which typically pay lower wages. It is also important to recognise that the overall UK average is influenced very much by the London and South East regions, where household incomes are significantly higher than most other regions. I call Bronwyn McGahan. 
Gurumi Ogad, I, I thank the Minister for his response. How does the Minister propose to address the challenges of income inequality? Gurumi Ogad. Wait, this, this, is, this is a problem that you know, Northern Ireland has faced for, for, for a number of years and isn't going to be you know, very simply or very easily resolved by me or indeed by, by anybody within any minister within the executive. And, you know, I think we, we have most economies, and the, the member's question talks about uh, an imbalance between Great Britain and or the, rest of Great Britain, or the rest of the United Kingdom, principally Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland. That's an imbalance which does tend to happen, Deputy Speaker, in, in most economies. You know, so even if you look south of the border, you would see uh, incomes and disposable household incomes higher, say, in Dublin than it would be in the west of Ireland or Donegal or somewhere like that. Um, over the 2007 to 11 period, the average disposable household income has increased year on year in Northern Ireland. The issue has been more that, particularly London and the South East, even though we've been in the middle of a very, very difficult uh, economic crisis, their average disposable household income has risen quite considerably over that time. So the gap that was already there has increased. In terms of how we address it, as I say, it's not an easy thing to address, but this is where the executive's economic strategy comes into play and are focusing not just on why it's important that we get jobs into our economy at a time whenever there are, there are fewer jobs. And I, I welcome the significant progress made by the Jobs Fund that the Economy Minister announced yesterday. We need to continue to pursue through investment in skills, investment in our infrastructure, and in trying to attract new businesses into Northern Ireland and existing businesses to grow encourage them to move into sectors where the average wage is higher than has traditionally been the case. And that's why the targets within the programme for government are not just on new jobs, but on new jobs that pay higher wages, because that is the only way in which we can close that gap. I'm not sure that we would ever entirely close the gap because of those natural distortions that there are within economies, but we can certainly attempt and do our best to bridge them. I call Paul Gervin. Thank the Minister for his answer so far. I'm just, uh, has there ever been a comparison between our household income in Northern Ireland uh, in comparison to those of the Republic? There's, it's hard sometimes to do direct comparisons between, between one economy and another. And, and whilst you know, we, we have much easier comparability within the United Kingdom between Northern Ireland and, and, as the initial question highlighted, a 2,000 differential between us and 2,000 pound a year differential between disposable income here and the UK average, um, which is, as I said, distorted by places like London, which have a £20,000 average disposable household income. Um, there isn't a direct read across and methodology between our figures and anything that the Irish government produced. However, um, Eurostat, which is the sort of European-wide agency for looking at um, all statistics, do do an analysis of what they call purchasing power standards, where they um, actually convert using and look at all sorts, not just wages, but they look at uh, living costs and obviously currency and things and, and, and come up with a, a sort of a fictional currency to, 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 to measure things by. But that shows that um, households in Northern Ireland have higher disposable incomes than households in the Republic of Ireland, which I think is an interesting figure. You know, if you look at some of the stats, you might see that wages in the South are considerably higher than they are in Northern Ireland. But because of taxation, because of the cost of living, Actually, whenever you break it down and you compare it on a like for like basis, people in Northern Ireland have a higher disposable income than their counterparts in the Irish Republic. We'll move on then. David Hillage. David Hillage, question seven. Capital projects, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, are important in helping uh, to support the economic growth of Northern Ireland. Such projects must move forward quickly. If there is any indication that current commissioning and delivery systems are not efficient and timely, then this causes me concern. However, it should be noted that while individual projects can be delayed, none of the capital available for the executive to spend has been returned to Her Majesty's Treasury during this Assembly's mandate. These issues were recently the subject of a strategic review of the commissioning and delivery system for major infrastructure projects in Northern Ireland. Uh, undertaken by the Strategic Investment Board and Central Procurement Directorate from my own department. The report of this review has been presented to the Procurement Board, which I chair. Uh, the Procurement Board has set up a subgroup to address the issues raised by the review and to bring forward proposals aimed at improving infrastructure commissioning and delivery. I look forward to receiving the results of this work. I call David Hildage. Deputy Speaker, and do you thank the Minister for his answer. What is being done, Minister, to ensure that industry has confidence in the future pipeline for infrastructure projects? The, the, this is probably the... Whenever, whenever I uh, engage with uh, the business community, 
you know, aside from always getting asked about rates, the second issue that always comes up is always about procurement in general terms, Deputy Speaker. And probably if you were to break down all of those sorts of questions that I get, the area where there is always a concern is that there is a lack of certainty um, about what is moving forward in terms of what we as a government and what our various departments are commissioning in terms of capital projects. Um, now sometimes it's, e it's, it's hard um, to do that with certainty because of funding, but sometimes we do know, we, generally we do know the money that we have and we do know the projects we're going to earmark that for. Now, from time to time, things will fall through the cracks like the A5. You know, nobody foresaw that that wasn't going to happen. That then created a, a major issue, Deputy Speaker, in terms of the money that was sitting there that couldn't be spent that we had to reallocate. Um, there, are, there, are already, um, uh, there is already a system in place, which is the uh, investment strategy for Northern Ireland's um, delivery tracking system. Um, which is, I think, perfectly capable of addressing this problem of a lack of certainty on the private sector's part about what we are commissioning as a government. The problem with that has been that its use hasn't been universal by all departments, and even by those who have used it, they haven't updated it as frequently as we would like them to. So we already have the system in place, and it's, I think it's, it's my job and, and working through the procurement board to encourage all departments to use that delivery tracking system to update it regularly. And that, I hope, will give the private sector the certainty that they need to tool up as and when required to deliver those projects that we want them to deliver. I call Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Could Minister um, outline what steps can be taken to improve the nature and role of communication between government departments around business cases? Yeah. The, the issue of, of, of business cases is something which um, I think there's, there's, traditionally there has been uh, a view that it is officials in my department who are sitting on business cases and not progressing them. You know, I, I wouldn't say that in every case that we are um, without blame. I think that we are unfairly blamed in many cases for holding up business cases. Sometimes business cases arrive into the Department of Finance and they're, they're incomplete. There's important uh, information that is missing and that will naturally slow things up. Sometimes I think some departments will test the water a wee bit so they'll put in something that they know isn't complete so that Department of Finance tells them this is the sort of two or three areas which you need to give us a bit more detail on. They then go away and the next business iteration of the business case, Deputy Speaker, obviously addresses those issues. So it's a bit of a game of, of cat and mouse in some ways. Um, I think there, had, there was some analysis that was carried out independently and, and, and we are processing them in what I consider to be a timely manner. But I'm always very keen to, to improve performance. And one of the things that the procurement board subgroup which is looking at the delivery of infrastructure projects is going to look at specifically as business cases and I want them to come back with uh, a series of recommendations including how perhaps even though I think the, the system isn't too bad we can still improve it in respect of business cases. I call Dominic Bradley. Um, can I ask the Minister has he had any discussions with uh, the Cal Minister in relation to the delivery of uh, major capital projects past and current? It's one of the members usually sort of very crypt, you know, uh, idiosyncratic uh, cryptic questions that he asks. I'm not quite sure whether he uh, whether he's talking about a specific project or not. Um, but the, you know, my, my, certainly my, my predecessor would have had uh, significant discussions with the, the current culture minister and indeed previous ministers about the stadia project for example and, and the current minister and I have had some discussions um, about that as well and officials have as well and you know, decal is, is isn't a center of procurement expertise in itself and it tends to use the center of it uses the center of procurement um, center of procurement directorate for, for that function so there is probably more an official level continual contact between my officials and the Minister of Culture's officials on capital projects. I call Leslie Cree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, bearing in mind that capital projects have a long lead in time, what is your opinion on working up to tender stage other projects so that if there's any slippage, uh, they have a reserve um, sort of pool of projects to fall back on? Yeah, I, I think this is an area where, where we do need to, to look at, but we need to look at it very much with open eyes. About, I, I agree with the member. I think if you take the A5 as a, as a situation, you know, we had to sort of step back, have a discussion, what projects were ready to go, what weren't ready to go, and that meant that, you know, and I think we were able to fund some exceptionally good projects with the money that we, was released from the A5, not moving forward. Um, but, you know. In a normal set of circumstances, or in a better set of circumstances, what you would have had would a ready-made list 
of projects across all departments which could have moved forward quite quickly, which fitted in with the strategic objectives that the executive had for Northern Ireland. Now, there, there is an issue in terms of progressing things too far. So the member mentioned to go to tender stage. To get to that stage is, is quite significantly down the line almost. You're, you're basically ready to go. Um, and that incurs some cost. It raises expectations within localities. So if we take a, a hospital project or a roads project through to that stage, people might expect it to happen very quickly. And then the money might arrive, and it could be further few years before it happens. So we need to balance those sorts of things out with, I think, the sound, sound and sensible management of a capital budget. But it's certainly something that I would like to see coming forward as a part of this review that we are looking at you know, how could we prioritise much better as many projects as we possibly can. And that is the end of the period of time for oral questions to the Minister, and we move on to topical questions. And I call Hall Given. Um, the Minister will recall that this Assembly debated the equal pay uh, issue for NIO and PSNI staff um, last year. Is he able to provide the Assembly with an update in terms of any progress on that area? I think the, the member first question, Deputy Speaker. The, the member will, will, will also recall that early on in, in my time in office, I expressed, I, actually in this House, um, I expressed a, uh, a keenness to re examine this issue, and I, I have done that, and I have received uh, submissions from, from officials in, in respect of this issue, and I've, I've, I've pondered those over the last number of months. I think it has been characterised as an issue, and indeed the member did so in his question. It's been characterised, I think, for ease. If, if not necessarily, Deputy Speaker, for accuracy as an equal pay issue. The judgment of the court in respect of this matter back in, I think it was March of last year, made it very, very clear that this was not an equal pay issue um, and that those uh, members of uh, members of staff employed in the NIO and the police service and so forth uh, were not entitled to access the terms of the equal pay settlement for Northern Ireland civil service staff. Uh, so in considering this issue and looking at it, it's very, very clear uh, and my conclusion is that there is no legal way to extend the terms of the equal pay settlement to those members of staff. But I still have, uh, as a member will appreciate, sympathy for the position those members of staff find themselves in. I have sympathy for the argument that is put by them, even if it doesn't have any actual legal standing. And I am committed to continuing to explore ways in which the moral argument that they have been putting and putting consistently could in some way be recognised. I call Paul Given. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for that uh, response? Um, at the Justice Committee, we had briefings from departmental officials, and to say that uh, that department, led by its minister, has been reluctant on this issue, I think, is an accurate one. Uh, however, after the Assembly debated the issue and passed a motion on it, the Justice Minister has sent the letter to the. Have a question, please. Yes, it's coming. Uh, the, the Justice Minister has corresponded with the Finance Minister, indicating that he wants to be helpful. <coughs> has uh, the Finance Minister now had any discussions with the Justice Minister to find out if there is any progress that that department can make in assisting? The, uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Minister of, of Justice did indeed. Uh, he, he and my predecessor had been in correspondence back and forward that then had carried on into my tenure in office. Uh, he did correspond with me back in the autumn. Um, at that time, I was still considering the issue and what could be done. Um, uh, I was still considering that advice and, and the issue generally. I have uh, subsequently, in, in recent days, actually spoken to the Minister of, of Justice, and he has been actually quite helpful. And uh, he and I have agreed that officials from each of our departments will will, con will commence work on identifying possible solutions uh, to this issue um, that we can then in turn then take to our executive of colleagues. Um, I still don't want to have to say, and I made this very clear back um, in the autumn when I first answered a question about this, I don't want to unduly raise expectations of staff, but I hope that they can see both in the commitment that I made to look at it and reopen it as an issue. It was an issue that had gone away. Uh, I reopened it, took a look at it again. Um, I am continuing to look at ways in which we can find a satisfactory solution to it, while at the same time not raising unduly expectations that the staff who have gone through quite a lot over the last number of years have already endured. I call Barry McElduff. Can I ask the Minister how focused his department is on removing obstacles to cross-border mobility in the area of finance? And I'm specifically thinking of the situation of a person who might live in County Tyrone, for example, work in County Monaghan, and have tax credit difficulties? The sort of issues that the member raises are, are 
you know, very characteristic right across different states within Europe, beyond as well, I'm sure. Um, if there are, you know, and, and I'm sure members who represent constituencies that are closer to the border than perhaps mine might see the frequency of this through their constituency offices a lot more than me and, and some colleagues would. Um, I mean, I have, if somebody finds themselves in a predicament where because of you know, living in one jurisdiction but working in another, that they fall foul of the system in some way. If there's anything that uh, I or, or my department can do, I'm, my doors are, are, are open for, to offer any assistance to anybody that, that might require it. I call Barry McIldoff. I welcome what the Minister has said. Uh, one suggestion I might put to the Minister and invite his comment is that perhaps he could work closely with the Enterprise Trade and Investment Minister on properly resourcing the independent advice network uh, in areas like Enniskillen, Straban, Oma and Uri, you know, where, where the, there is a proliferation of these issues coming forward? I can, what I can certainly do in the, in the first instance and commit to is, is um, given that it's a responsibility for, for my, my colleague, the Enterprise Minister, rather than myself, what I can do is I can commit to contacting the Minister, raising the issues that the members raise, and ensure that whatever advice in terms of how to handle some of the scenarios that the member has outlined, um, the best way to handle those is available to advisors, whether it be in the CAB or other independent uh, advice providers. I call Danny Kinnahan. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Speaker. Um, I asked the, the, the Minister, that in lieu of his statement this morning, um, and the fact that in education we need more, Monday, more money per pupil and we need more money for maintenance and capital, is the Education Minister missing out by not taking up his EYF or his efficiency savings plans, and in fact, is he actually denying other departments from having the benefits of more money too? Well, the, the, the member, thank the member for, for, his, for his question. It's sort of a conflation of, of, of two issues. Let me try to separate them if I can. Uh, in, in respect of uh, EYF scheme, which was mentioned, um, in fact, I explicitly mentioned it uh, during my statement earlier this morning, um, that was something that was started in 2011, 2012, after the, the broader EYF scheme that the executive had uh, disappeared. Um, it started with an opening balance of some £56.7 million. Pounds, and under the terms of the scheme, the Department of Education bid uh, £20 million for £20.5 million pounds in uh, June monitoring in 11-12, and that was agreed. In January of that year, then, they had a reduced requirement of 10 and a half. So the, the number has been, has been coming down. Uh, that, that is, um, and, and then this year, there was... Um, I, my information is that there was as many drawdowns from that scheme as there was money being put back into it. The, the, the system was put there to allow for the sensible management. As I think we'd all, anybody who's particularly had been on a, a board of governors in the past, uh, deputy speaker may still be, had seen that schools sometimes, like the capital budget that the central government uh, operates, sometimes will want to commit the expenditure but can't quite do that. And it was a better way to manage some expenditure that they might make within their schools. So it is a good scheme and it has worked and we haven't had any issues or any problems with it. Um, whether or not uh, the minister is availing of it properly, I think it's more a matter for the schools and whether they're availing of it properly and perhaps schools aren't wanting to commit to certain types of expenditure because of other problems that they're having at the minute. So you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's perhaps worth um, some of my officials pursuing it a little bit further and whether uh, the scheme needs to be tidied up. Or, or in terms of, of, of the, the Minister of Education's failure to participate in um, uh, savings delivery plan process, you know, it is disappointing that that didn't start at the beginning of this budget. Um, and it's, it's, you know, I, I think that whilst the Minister may, and I can't speak for them, I certainly wouldn't even dare try to speak for the Minister for edu of Education for a whole host of reasons. Um, there are, you know, I, don't, I think his lack of participation gives, whether, whether he's administering his budget properly or not, it fails to give the member and other colleagues the proper insight into what he is spending his money on. I call Danny Kinnahan. Um, thank you very much. And if I may stay with education, we had announcements on uh, shared education campuses. Is this money that is being planned from OFM, DFM, or is this a separate um, sort of solar run of funding from within the education? Where do we, we sit on that? Deputy Speaker, thank, thank the member for, for his follow-up question. Um, the, the member might recall that as, as part of the economic pact agreed between the executive and the prime minister back in june of last year that we were allowed to um, draw down additional um, rri borrowing of i think 100 million over over the next two years and as long as they were specifically for shared education shared housing projects uh, only one has been able to go forward so far deputy speaker and that's the Lissanelli project I understand that there are other projects being worked up, particularly in the area of housing. And what I understand, and again, I wouldn't wish to speak for the Minister of Education, I, what I understand is his call for schemes to come forward is 
to take up that funding that is available from Treasury, which we have asked for, and we'll be unfortunate if we don't have schemes to take up that funding after having asked the Treasury for it in the first place. Raymond McCartney is not in his place. I call Fergal McKinney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I return to an issue that we uh, discussed this morning and uh, in terms of the 30 million for the health department? Would the minister accept that up to 20 million of the 30 million allocation could go to clinical negligence? And in the context of that 30 million, would the minister accept that rather than reducing pressures, clinical negligence is increasing pressure on frontline services? Right. Clinical negligence is something that is an unfortunate reality. There has been a, quite a number of cases have built up and developed up over the last number of years. They are starting to crystallise in terms of having, because of actions taken by the court, and that is then putting pressure on the Minister of Health's budget. Now, the, under, the money that has been allocated to the Minister through the January monitoring round is principally for frontline services, so the stuff that I outlined to the member this morning, in fact, that he raised with me, the likes of the pressures that are a and e are facing, winter pressures, uh, pressures on elective surgery, and so on and so forth, and indeed uh, right into the, the care side of, of the budget as well. Um, but I would make this point. The Minister of Health does face pressures in respect of clinical negligence, and they have been well outlined in the past. He is having to uh, mop up those problems as they crystallise. If we don't, I say, uh, the point I would make to the member, which I think he, he perhaps missed earlier, is that you know, if the minister spends some of his allocation on, on um, clinical negligence, whilst it isn't as desirable, perhaps, as it might be to bring forward additional care or support or operations or whatever it might be, if he doesn't pay them and settle them this year, then he faces an you know, there's an opportunity cost elsewhere in the system for not having done it. So the effect is the same. It is still going to hit frontline services, whether he pays that money or not, out of, out of the allocation that he has received. I call Fergal McKinney. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But given the vast sum, sums of money involved, what is the Minister and the Health Department together going to do to tackle the issue of clinical negligence, negligence and its implications? This is, this is a matter principally for um, the Minister of Health in terms of how he is dealing with uh, clinical negligence. You know, it, it is not for, I mean, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure his party colleague, the Department of Environment, as much as I might like to interfere in, in the Department of the Environment's business, I can't tell the Minister of Health how he should deal with clinical negligence. I, mean, I imagine that the Minister of Health doesn't want to see any clinical negligence cases. He wants to ensure that the highest standards of care and health and support are given. So, you know, I, I, I'm happy to work, and I have shown and exhibited a willingness to work with my colleague. Um, in the Department of Health to ensure that those pressures that materialise and that affect negatively on his budget from whatever the source are dealt with in year as best we possibly can. I call Mickey Brady. Well, I got the last concordia. Um, can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the impact on economic growth of static wage levels and rising household costs? The, the, I, I think the, the, we are starting to see, I think, positively some movement in the economy, and I think you know, the member would agree that um, you know, we have started to see, over, particularly over the last few months and even into the first few weeks, with the odd exception, positive news on the economic front. I was, I mean, I was surprised to see, uh, positively surprised to see the Danske Bank uh, Consumer Confidence Survey showing its highest levels on record. So that's a positive sign that the economy is moving forward. But I think we will see on, on, the, on the even economy, uh, economic growth, we will see good news and we will see some bad news. And you know, I do think that, and I've expressed this publicly before, that I think that the last place in which we will start to experience recovery is in people's confidence and in people's pockets. And one of the ways in which many, particularly businesses, and, including, and indeed even the public sector as well, has tried to address the pressures that we have been under is to look at wage levels and try to keep those under control. Now, obviously, that will, we would hope, rise as the economy improves. Indeed, I know that the uh, comments from the Chancellor last week that he is in favour of an above inflation increase in the minimum wage, which you know, the member might suggest that the minimum wage is too low anyway, but I think it's at least it's heading in a positive direction. Uh, I think that it will hopefully follow from economic growth that wage levels and uh, house, household, you know, and in terms of household overheads, you know, I think we all accept that there is continued pressure on that front, um, and that. Again, we may not see a lot of positivity in that area, uh, even if the economy is growing. I call Mickey Brady. 
I thank the Minister for his answer. A recent report, Minister, indicated that the average disposable income in households in Britain was approximately £168 here in the North, 57. Would the Minister not agree that the introduction of a living wage would not only help households keep their heads above water, but would also add uh, and inject stimulus into the local economy uh, in areas such as retail? I, I, I hope the you know, if the Low Pay Commission recommends to the Chancellor that the minimum wage goes up, uh, it could go some way to address some of the issues that the member has expressed. I think we, we have to be mindful. I think everybody here, and I, I answered a question to the members, uh, from the member's colleague earlier on a similar topic, everybody wants to see incomes go up because that is, that is a good thing, particularly when there are pressures elsewhere. Um, but we have to balance wanting particularly the private sector to increase wages at the lower end. Um, with the fact that we are in the infancy of, of economic recovery. And I don't want to see anything done that dissuades firms from actually employing people, because well, that's what we need most. We need people who have been out of work, have gone onto the unemployment register, those who are coming off welfare and onto the unemployment register, back into work. And if wages go up and go up too high, that might be the very reason that all, that may be enough reason for many firms not to take on the people that we want to see them start to employ again. And that is the end of questions to ministers for today.